Uh, welcome to the National Postal Museum, to your National Postal Museum. Welcome to the 16th uh, Maynard Sudman Lecture. Uh, and I would like to thank Susan, Jesse, and Lauren for helping put this event together. And I would especially like to thank uh, Don Sudman and his brother David for their generosity in making this uh, special event happen every year. So thank you very much, Don. So I'm going to be introducing Don. I was told to keep it very short, and I will. Uh, Don is the president of the Mystic Stamp Company, uh, the largest such co company in the United States, if not North America. He's also the chairman of the Council of Philatelists for the National Postal Museum here. What I learned in looking up Don, some of Don's history, uh, in addition to being a leader in the philatelic community, which that started back in 1974 when he became the president of the Mystic Stamp Company. So we're, not to give secrets away, we're similar in age, and uh, I'm entering college and he's running a company. So very ambitious uh, and obviously very successful in those years. Uh, and Don, when he took over, uh, realized that he did not have enough stamps at the Mystic Stamp Company, or maybe just not the right stamps. Uh, and then he began to restructure the Mystic Stamp Company to provide the best products and service to its customers which if you think about it is very similar to what a museum does. How do we provide the best exhibits, the best programming, uh, and the best opportunities for our visitors here at the National Post and Museum? So I'd like to thank Don. I've been here now almost, uh, over two years. Uh, I'd like to thank him for his keen insight, his advice, for your friendship. Uh, and I could not think of a better, stronger partner to be working with than Don Sudman and the Council of Philatelists as we move to transform the museum uh, toward the next century. So with that, Don, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Elliot. The, uh, and welcome. Uh, I'm uh, so happy that people uh, come to this lecture to honor my father, Maynard Sundman. And so I'm going to speak just a little bit about uh, his legacy and uh, why I'm here. Um, and uh, my dad started selling stamps in the 1930s. And he had saved $400 uh, from working various jobs and uh, started his little business. And um, he shut it down uh, for World War II, which ties in a little bit with this story today, and uh, entered the army. And he went to North Africa and Italy. And he told me stories about how when uh, he wasn't uh, he was like just a few days behind the fighting, and so he would go into these towns in Italy and look at the post offices to see if they had any stamps, and there'd be snipers firing, a, a little bit like the Hillary Clinton story, I guess, in Croatia, where she got off the plane, but I think my father's was true. Uh, four years later, the war ended. He moved to New Hampshire with my mother, started the Littleton Stamp Company and uh, later started selling coins. In 1974, my family bought Mystic Stamp Company in Camden, New York, uh, central New York. Uh, my dad was 60 years old uh, when we bought that business. So I think it's kind of neat that uh, he was no kid and still uh, taking on debt and uh, uh, getting into uh, adding an additional business uh, to our family business. So Littleton is now Littleton Coin Company. Uh, Mystic is Mystic Stamp Company. And both are leaders in our fields, and we help thousands of collectors enjoy the hobby of stamp and coin collecting. We believe that the world's better off with more collectors. It's such a fantastic hobby, and uh, it leads to, um, you know, it's goal-oriented, uh, lifelong learning. It's really a, a fantastic uh, way to spend time. And my father's mission, uh, which my brother and I continue, is to bring the fun of collecting to a wide audience. And so that's part of why we love the Smithsonian, is that, uh, you know, what better name in the world than the Smithsonian for museums? And what better postal museum? This is fantastic. So we're very proud that we're associated with it and we can do this lecture. So the museum also brings the fun of collecting, exposes it to you know, hundreds of thousands of people a year. And this lecture, I think, is part of that mission. Uh, I'm very happy and proud to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Great. So I'm Susan Smith. I'm the Blunt Research Chair here. And what we're going to do today is a little bit different from what we've done in the past. We are going to uh, learn about the collections and the project. 
from our two speakers and then have a moderated panel with some questions and then we're going to open up to Q&A from the floor and from people that are watching this streaming. So thank you very much, Don, for your support for this program. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, we have Kay Sedema and Jeffrey Grunenfeldt, and they're going to start with a presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kay Zedema, and uh, this is my co-author, Jeffrey Grunenfeldt. We are honored to speak today about two subjects that really reinforce each other. One, that postal history and its social cousin are very much history and should be treated as such. And two, that social history can make a pacifist point by describing the horrors of World War II. These are fascinating times for postal history, which used to be the stepchild of philately. No more. People like Elliot Landau paved the way with exhibits such as Lincoln, slavery, and the Civil War, which exposed racism. In our case, the emphasis is on the Second World War. That that subject has gained so much in popularity is no coincidence. In June of this year, it was 75 years ago, that the Allies landed in Normandy. The so-called greatest generation is dying out. I cannot tell you how many children of deceased World War II veterans have come up to me after one of my talks to express, express regret not knowing more about their father's exploits during the war. Many veterans refuse to talk about it, and now it is too late. So it is up to people like Jeffrey and myself to speak and write about the war using our own collections. We also use family archives to shed lights on obscure facts. Both of us believe in shedding light on the often fascinating lives of those involved. You will see a few examples in the PowerPoint presentation that follows. Truth be told, eight years ago, when the idea for this book first took shape, I did not know where it would lead. Then gradually I realized, and Jeffrey, who would become my co-author, concurred. The content gradually assumed an importance that exceeded philately, or indeed, postal history. By writing about war, we made a steep statement about peace. Jeffrey and I show that surviving letters and documents form the proof that events really happened, that concentration camps really existed, that countless millions really perished. A recent poll concluded that 22% of Americans are not aware of the Holocaust. They do not deny it, they're ignorant of it. Our collections enabled us to trace back the start of censorship, the genesis of internment and Nazi concentration camps, and Goebbels' fake news propaganda machine, to name but a few subjects out of many. The letters and documents provide a chronological path of paper evidence for the entire Nazi era. Thus, the title, The Paper Trail. It is our mission to keep the facts alive to honor those who can no longer do so. We dedicated the book to our children, and especially our grandchildren, one of whom is sitting over there, in the hope that they will see a more peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you. 
we will now start with the PowerPoint presentation. And where I gave the introduction, Jeffrey will give the conclusion. My family lived in Arnhem um, of a bridge too far fame in September of 1944. Operation Market Garden, the attack, Montgomery's attack on Arnhem to create a path to the east and enter Germany, started on September 17, 1944. It was also the day that my brother was born in the cellar of our house in Arnhem. Of course, a situation like that where eventually the Germans defeated the Allies, sadly enough, it is also a philatelic candy shop for a collector. Because a letter such as this one, the 16th of September 1944, was sent to Arnhem, was returned, this is, of course, a wonderful piece for a postal historian because there are so many aspects to it. Um, I just wanted to show one picture of my brother and myself at the end of the war. Um, it was May 1945. We, were, we had moved to um, near Amsterdam where the hunger winter was in effect. And uh, we managed to survive. My father died right after the war because of the uh, result of the war. I mentioned this to show how personal this subject is to me. And you'll see to Jeffrey. So this is Operation Market Garden. Here is where we lived. The Allies attacked like this. They didn't manage to get across the bridge to Germany. So. The whole town of Arnhem was evacuated by the Germans. They, uh, it was mentioned in the um, Nuremberg trials as one of the towns that had suffered way out of proportion to everybody, to, uh, everybody else. The Germans took every pot and pan, made everybody move east, move, move west, uh, where there was no food. And the town was totally uh, robbed by, uh, by the Germans who took all, all the furniture, every pot and pan, and sent them to the towns in Germany, like Duisburg and Dusseldorf, that were bombed. And they, uh, all these subjects were taken by, uh, by, by the Germans. Right. No. All right. Uh, I was born after the war, 1963. And this is a picture of me as a baby with my parents and maternal grandparents uh, who'd come to the Netherlands in the early 1950s when they uh, fled uh, Indonesia after it gained independence. Like so many others from the former colony, they did not speak much about the war because they had to adapt to a new life in Holland uh, where they were not always uh, favorably received. Um, later, my mother told me that her father had suffered enormous traumas because of what had happened during the war. He had been a train driver and was arrested by the infamous Kempei Tai, this Japanese secret police, uh, tortured and was about to be beheaded because so he had committed sabotage during one of the train transports. Only because one of his brave superiors pleaded for his release, saying that the trains could not run any longer uh, because they needed all train drivers, uh, he was released, which was an exceptional uh, example of mercy, which, which the Japanese did not very often show. My mother lost three uncles during the war. Uh, two of them were slaughtered by the Japanese, and one uh, suffered from pneumonia and died in a Japanese camp in Nagasaki in 1944. Um, unfortunately, not many uh, or n no document or letter at all uh, remains from the war in Indonesia because after the war, the Dutch independent or the Indonesian independence war started, which was even more ferocious and, and horrible for, for my family because they were Dutch after all. And luckily, I found in the Dutch archive the camp card 
from my great uncle who died in Nagasaki. And this is the only picture that we've got left of him. And we thought that this was a suitable and very appropriate start of our uh, book, The Paper Trail. Right. So this was really the start of my collection. Um, I found this card in the box of material that, uh, that I had bought, and it was um, um, nothing special as far as I could see until I saw the name of the person to whom the card was addressed. I said, I know this man, Hymans. Harry Hymans um, was a member of the New York Collectors Club, which I joined in 1965. We, had a Dutch society that met there every month. And Harry Hymans, um, by the time I bought this, had already died. I said, man, ah, this is an interesting card. I gotta, gotta figure out how this thing got to Batavia and then to New York. So here's what happened. Um, Holland was occupied by the Germans on May 10th, 1940. And um, immediately, mail traffic stopped. It was reinstated on the 18th, uh, 19th, or 20th of June. So this card was sent right after that um, to Java from Amsterdam. I said, my goodness, how did this thing get there? Well, it went via Berlin, where, um, where it was censored by the, by the Germans. Then uh, it went to Moscow, and then the, 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 uh, the mail had to be taken off the train because the gauges for the train were different. So now this thing goes to Moscow, uh, it goes to Chita, to Harbin, to Mukden. Originally it would have gone to Vladivostok because there was a ferry service from Vladivostok to Shimonoseki in Japan. However, the Japanese uh, by that time had become pretty aggressive and the Soviets didn't trust them anymore. So they said to everybody, no, no, you can't go to Vladivostok, you gotta take, take this train. So Trans-Siberia Express, and then the trans manchurian Express. So this card then went to Korea, Busan, which was Japan occupied, then to Tokyo, and then by neutral ship to Batavia. But when it got there, uh, Harry Hyman's head uh, had seen uh, the, the writing on the wall, so he had moved back to New York. So this card was then forwarded to New York. So now it goes back from Batavia to Hong Kong. It goes all the way back to San Francisco and overland to New York. How do we know that the card arrived? It came out of his estate. So obviously, uh, obviously it got there. But then, and here is where the social aspect takes over. Because then I saw the name of the writer of the card. And the guy's name is Abraham Asher. And I said, I know that name too. I, Abraham Asher was a famous, uh, the, the top lawyer in Holland, one could say, and he lived on one of the canals in Amsterdam. I went there actually to that address. It's, it's one of the top addresses. It has been changed a little bit on the outside, but it's obviously a top, top address. So I said, my goodness, I have to find out what Abraham Asher is all about. So I did the research. Um, the Dutch Jews, had to declare all their property to the Nazis. And they usually would find, if you were wealthy, they usually would find some mistake, some tiny mistake that said, ha ha, you tried to, uh, you tried to mess with us. We confiscate your entire property. And that is what happened to Abraham Asher. So the family then moved to a small apartment in the southern part of Amsterdam. And what happened to Abraham Asher? Well, he was also punished for his fraudulent behavior, as they call it, and he was sent to Camp Amersfoort. Abraham Asher was an al um, a um, diabetic. Jews could not receive packages. So Abraham Asher died after two months uh, because of his diabetic condition. His wife and daughters, three daughters, 14, 13, and 11, were put on a train first to the holding camp, the trancing camp in the, in the north of Holland. And then in 1943, they arrived in Auschwitz and all died on the same day. 
Well, if we go back to the beginning of the war, uh, May the 14th, the bombardment of Rotterdam. This is a cover which is a witness of uh, the bombardment. And um, it's one, one of the few covers left from the bombardment. Uh, only a handful has, uh, has remained. Um, it was posted by, let's see, by the Council of the Poor at the uh, Witte de Witstraat in Rotterdam, which was actually one of the streets that was bombed heavily and almost completely destroyed. And what you see here are some burn marks. And there is a stamp over here. There are no postal marks because they were all destroyed during the bombardment. But there was a stamp left which said the following thing, retrieved damage from letterbox by the post office in Rotterdam. And, well, that could have been any uh, damaged, of course, but the date right here says arrived the 20th of May 1940. Somehow during those turbulent times, uh, officials still stuck to procedures. And because of these procedures, just stamping letters when they arrived, we know that this indeed was a coffer that witnessed uh, the events of the bombardment in uh, Rotterdam. And, uh, well, something to, uh, which you will not find very easily nowadays, but, well, perhaps remember the dates. May 1940, Rotterdam, see some burn marks and you know for sure that it is a witness of those ordeals. Right. This is um, a very special cover. It's dated the 4th of December, 1944, Bethel, Ohio. Um, this letter was carried on a plane from San Francisco. It was supposed to go to Sumatra, but had to make a stop in Honolulu. Uh, as, it, as it turned out, uh, the plane left 40 minutes late and thus arrived 40 minutes early in Honolulu when the captain received a message uh, from his company saying code A, which meant war in the Pacific. If the plane had been on time, it would have been shot down by the Japanese because the, the attack started at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning, the 7th. Uh, but what was interesting, um, the plane was hidden in Hilo and we know that because uh, this is the sensor, this was uh, released by ICB, which was the information control branch, the, the American censorship office. But here comes the social aspect again. Why was this plane 40 minutes late? Well, not in your wildest imagination will you guess this. The captain's daughter, Captain Turner, and this is all documented, his daughter had a piano recital and he asked the company, Pan Am, he says, is it all right if I leave a little later? And they said, yeah, sure. You know, was, there were some important people on board, including the prime minister of Thailand, Siam. Uh, so he left, he left 40 minutes late. And guess what? If he had been on time, that plane would have been shot down by the Japanese. So it is one believed to be one of three covers that was, covered, uh, that was carried on a... Uh, Pan Am Clipper called the Anzac Clipper. So it's a very rare piece. And you know, all philatelists like to brag a little bit about all the wonderful things that they have found. Well, I found this in a small box with five other covers that I had bought for next to nothing and realized the date that I did some research on it. It was one of three covers apparently known uh, that, that just made it uh, to Honolulu, but uh, was not shot down. All right, a philatelic coincidence. Well, th thanks to modern means of communication, Case and I were able to uh, exchange the text we had written and the uh, scans that we had made. And one day, uh, when we were working on the Dutch East Indies part, I sent some scans to, uh, to Case. And almost immediately, he, he responded in, in uh, acceleration, and he was really amazed, he said, because, well, 
without me knowing it, he had been writing on a soldier called de Groot. And he served the Dutch East Indies Army at the moment. And he was writing to his wife, and his wife was writing to him about the things that just happened. And he also wrote the moment when the Japanese invaded the Isle of Java. Uh, and one of the things he wrote was, for example, I'm going to sleep until 6 because I have to stay awake tonight. Hopefully those Japs are not going to wake us up again because, well, you may, have, may guess what, what happened. But um, the Groot, unfortunately, when, when the Japanese, there was a quick march through the Isles of Java and the Dutch had to surrender within a few days. Uh, the Groot was taken prisoner and in the end he, he died in a camp in, in Burma, I think it was. But I sent case scans and they turned out to be the second part of the archive that he had achieved in the 1990s at, at a stamp show in Singapore while I had bought the rest of the archive at the stamp show in Holland in the early 1990s. So after 75 years, we were able to uh, combine the two parts of the archive so that it has been restored right now. My part contained a Red Cross letter uh, indicating that the Groot indeed had died and an account of his burial at the Palembang uh, War Cemetery and some other information which told us that later on his body had been removed to the Menteng Pulo um, War Cemetery in the Dutch Indies in Descartes. This, this is the Red Cross letter that I sent to Case and which, well, to our surprise, combined the archive and restored it in the yeah. end. One of the many surprises that we had during our mm -hmm. uh, project. The war um, is asking, uh, or any war, is asking uh, people to confront their own conscience. Um, I decided also to include two documents. I could have picked uh, uh, quite a few different things, and so could Jeffrey. I have about a thousand letters in my, con in my collection, so we would have been here for a while if I had used them all. But, um, this is a Dutch officer sworn statement. Dutch officers were put into a camp uh, in Germany, but they were released if they would sign a letter of allegiance to the Germans. So what would you have done? You, the war is over, the Germans have won, they've taken you prisoner, now what are you gonna do? Are you gonna stay in a camp or are you going to sign this letter um, and go back to your family? It's one of those moral questions that those officers had to face. I can, get you, I can give you the answer. Most of them signed the letter and went home. They were severely criticized after the war because after the war fi uh, finished, the moral conflicts continued. The, the officers who had signed were severely criticized by the officers who had not signed. The second piece of, the second document is an example of Goebbels' fake news. Uh, he invented that, by the way. Uh, here, um, the letter, uh, this document is meant to be read on the German radio, the D German national radio. It's dated December 28, 1942. And this is supposed to be read by the journalist on, uh, on live radio and he is reporting how everything is going swimmingly for the Germans. Of course, they had just been beaten in El Alamein, and the fight uh, for Stalingrad was on the way. But here, um, the report says that uh, 46 German, uh, 46 uh, Soviet tanks had been destroyed, or 59 had been destroyed, and the Italian and, uh, and other allies uh, were of a great help uh, the war is going swimmingly, it's going to be over soon because everything is going just honky-dory. Right. Well, we, we, we all have philatelic items which we've stored in our albums, but we don't know about the background of them. And this is a letter sheet which was compulsory when you were interned in the Westerbork transit camp. 
And, well, it, it's not a very special letter sheet because there are thousands of them. Um, yet, most of the times, they are the last written remains of those who were sent to these and the concentration camps. So there is a high emotional value to them. When you, as we did, do some research on the receiver and the, uh, the sender, you will be astonished. In this case, the sender is a Mrs. Katz Franken, whose two sons were arts dealers in The Hague, I think it was. And they were forced by the Germans to collect all kinds of arts for the Führer Museum in Linz. And they possessed a Rembrandt, this one, which Dr. Posse, who was responsible for the Führer Museum, wanted desperately. And for some reason, he did not force them to give them this Rembrandt, but they made a deal. 25 members of the Katz family who had already been at Westerbork transit camp were released in exchange for this very valuable Rembrandt. And some members of the Katz family were allowed to go abroad to Gibraltar, to, the, uh, to Jamaica, to the Gibraltar camp where Jews uh, were awaiting the end of the war. Mrs. Katz, their mother, was released and died peacefully in 1944, aged 75. The sender, her daughter Sibylla, unfortunately was sent to a concentration camp, to the infamous Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Yet, when the Russians approached, the inmates were transported by train to one of the other camps, but for some reason the train never reached its final destination and it got lost. It wandered uh, through Germany and after weeks it stopped near Leipzig where the guards left the train and in, after a few days the train was discovered by the locals. When they opened the cars they noticed that almost everyone had died including Sibylla Levy Katz. This is the Shipkow Memorial, which was erected after the war in memory of those who perished on the train. Just an ordinary letter sheet, ordinary letter sheet, but a very spectacular story behind it. We wanted to cover a little bit, um, uh, because we have a, a time limit. Uh, this is um, a card quite rare from the Thai Burma Railway um, prison, prison camp. This is a Dutch, this was written by a Dutch lieutenant um, who was held prisoner uh, by, the, uh, by the Japanese and worked on the, on the railroad. Interesting thing is that uh, the Imperial Japanese Army always had a wonderful message for the people uh, uh, to whom the card was addressed, family members. Uh, it's also amazing that this card arrived. The Japanese, who had not signed the um, Geneva Convention, um, were first put on the censorship markings and then um, this is a Berlin censorship marking, so the letter arrived in Holland. It also came out of a Dutch archive. So here is what the, uh, the Japanese are writing for the family. Um, I am still in, in a POW camp uh, in Burma. There are 20,000 prisoners, being Australian, Dutch, English, and American. There are several camps of two to 3,000 prisoners who work at labor daily. We are quartered in very plain huts. The climate is good. Our life is easy with regard to food, medicine, and clothes. The Japanese commander sincerely endeavors to treat prisoners kindly. That was pre-printed. <laughs> Canteens are established where we can buy some extra food and smokes. By courtesy of the Japanese commander, we conduct concerts in the camp, and a limited number go to a picture show once a month. And then he writes, I am in good health. I just became a bit taller. And that was a code for he had lost a lot of weight and became very thin. 
All right, to end this part of our uh, presentation, <clears throat> I'm going to show you well, a very ordinary cover. It was posted right after the war in December and sent by one of the first flights to uh, the Dutch East Indies in 1945, censored by the Dutch censor. But what makes it interesting are, once again, the addressee and the sender. Because the addressee is, as you can see here, uh, Victor Koningsberger. And Victor Koningsberger was a courageous professor who, at the beginning of the war, as early as November 1940, protested when his Jewish colleagues at the University of Utrecht uh, were fired. Um, and because of that, he was arrested and spent 18 months of internment in one of the uh, internment centers in the southern part of uh, the country. And the addressee is Dr. Rumke, one of his friends who was a psychiatrist and who later examined uh, famous war criminals in, in the Netherlands. But at that moment, he was still in Java in a camp. During the war, he had been in a Japanese camp, and ironically, after the, its libera the liberation of the Dutch East Indies, the Dutchmen had to stay in those camps because the War of Independence had started and Dutch nationality, national, Dutch citizens were not really safe. Um, Victor Koningsberger, there is one, a portrait of him, and that's his friend, Dr. Rumke, wrote to his friend, because when we found this cover, our hearts started beating a bit fast because it contained the original letter. And in it, Victor Koningsberger tells about what happened to him and his family during the war. For example, he wrote, uh, the last year of the war, everyone was an outlaw. In addition to suffering terribly from coat, famine, and the round of, of males, there was total terror. And he also wrote about what he had heard about the Japanese camps where his friend had stayed. And he says that he thought it was even worse than he could ever have imagined. This is just another example of social history combined with postal history. And the contents of the letter and the cover makes it interesting. And as Kay said earlier, uh, surviving letters and documents from the past prove that events like the ones we've just described really happened. So the social context of all these philatelic items gives them extra value and not only money-wise. Thank you for your attention. Mm. Now we go over there. <clears throat> So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we're going to open it to the floor. So you've just seen a very good example of more traditional postal history of the postal markings, the rates and the routes, as well as the more social aspect of postal history, as well as some of the social impact that postal history can have. And as I was re-looking at your book, the two of you mentioned three different ways that postal history has a social impact. And you mentioned two of them here, and I wanted to ask about the third. So, um, Case, you had written that it helps us keep the flames of memory burning as long as we read and write, and obviously share in situations such as this one today. Contributing to peace by showing the ugliness of war. And Jeffrey, you had mentioned that you had come across somebody who you were able to reassure, a survivor, that something had actually happened, because you had the postal history as evidence. Are there more cases like that? Um, is that a, a common situation? It sounds like you've come across several pieces from people that you knew. You've talked to people, did some interviews. Can you talk a little bit about that aspect? Mm, yes, I can. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm trying to find a good example of, of one of the discoveries we made. Um, once, once, once I was given a, a little leaflet of... Mm -hmm. uh, well, clearly related to the war. It, it was printed in, in 1945, okay. I think it was. Okay. And uh, it, it were some regulations about well, how to send letters, but of course, we all know how to send letters. 
and then I did some research and it turned out that after the war there was some sort of interim government uh, which was organized by, by the military. So, so there was a military authority and they organized a new kind of service meant for people who were displaced persons mm -hmm. coming from the, the, the camps in, in the east, going back to Holland and then arrived in Holland and they were, well, they were, they were searched for some time and they were, well, uh, the health was checked upon. And while they were there, they sometimes they had to stay for a couple of weeks. They were able to send letters to their relatives. And well, once I had done the research on where these uh, instructions came from, I went to a, to a show and suddenly I saw some item written by uh, a, a student who had uh, refused to, to sign uh, the, the, the form that case referred to, oh, okay. which was for officers, but students also had to, to, to sign a loyalty uh, mm. paper. And many students, especially from Delft, refused to do so. And they were arrested and sent to camps in Germany. And this specific card, which was a special card issued by the, by, by the military authority, described exactly what the boy or the student had done, where he had gone through in, in Germany, and that he finally had returned home, and that he hoped that he would, well, meet his parents, which he still did not know whether they were alive or not. Uh, and he hoped that he would meet his parents in Delft very soon. Yeah. So, so that is another example right. of, of, yes, connecting postal history to, well, mm -hmm. the social aspect right. of it, yes. Right. Okay, and as you gave us a demonstration today, you use many materials beyond philatelic materials, the stamps, the covers, the markings. Um, you had posters and magazine covers and interviews and photos and passports and other forms of official ID. What are the challenges and are there any disadvantages to this approach you mean of to... using such a wide variety of material? Well, Other than uh, in my own case, I can only answer, uh, I, I don't know exactly what, uh, what system Jeffrey uh, used, but uh, Don asked me about it before. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did um, in my collection of letters, over the years, I always cut out pieces of newspaper articles, uh, articles in philatelic magazines, uh, personal notes, uh, radio articles. I mean, you can't, Im you can't imagine how many sources I used, and I'm not even talking about the major sources like the Holocaust Museum, which is an incredible resource with absolutely fantastic people. Mm -hmm. They were such a help. Um, and they helped, they helped us very much along. I would, I would put a name in, I said, you know, I can't find this person. And they said, oh, here it is. Oh my goodness, it was almost, mm -hmm. it, it was unbelievable how they, how they helped. And, and the Holocaust Museum is not the only museum that helped us, but the Jewish archives in Amsterdam they told me about uh, Asher mm -hmm. being having diabetes and, and not getting his insulin in the, in the camp, so that kind of thing. Another thing that is very interesting, I gave a talk not too long ago in, the, in Connecticut, uh, and uh, this lady comes up to me, she's in her 90s, and she says, you know, my family came here just before the war, but I have all the correspondence from my father mm -hmm. with a family in Westport, Connecticut. I said, wow, you know. She said, my family is Jewish. I don't want to mention the name, but she says it's not a typically Jewish name. Her father felt that they were going to be in trouble in Germany, that, that they saw it coming, but nobody wanted to sponsor them. What he did, he wrote to everybody with that same last name in the United States. None of them were Jewish. He wrote, to, he used all the phone books, apparently, according to, to this woman. He got one response from somebody in Westport, Connecticut, who had the same last name. He says, I'll sponsor you. Not only did he sponsor them, he paid for the trip. He paid for their lodging when they came to Connecticut. And went on and on, and this woman said to me, I said, did you ever figure out, what, what, why would this man do it? Apparently, he was married to the sister of Morgenthau, the treasury secretary. And then she said, you know, I want you to have my archive. I said, no, 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 no. You know, because that creates another 
a lot of responsibility. They have to write about this whole, whole thing, too. <laughs> I've done my writing. I, this is my fifth book, so it's enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, can, can I add? Uh, please, because, absolutely. Because well, people always say, well, you're a philatelist, so why do you need so much space? My, my wife is over there, and she can <laughs> confirm that, that philatelists need enormous amounts of space, not only because we well, collect stamps and post history, but all the other information. And one of the problems we had to face was we, because we've got so much in our own archives, right. which covers which, which, other, which, which other documents we had to include in the book, because the book is, well, what is it, 750 pages. It could have been 1,500 or even 2,000. Right. So, so yes, to, to choose the most important items. That was one of the challenges we had, we had to face. So what was the criteria for the most important objects? Oh, yes, oh, well, we, well. We had to agree. Yes. The, the, <laughs> which was that, very difficult. Which, <laughs> but you know something, I have, have, I've done a lot of writing, and I can tell you, and this is not because he's sitting here, but we have had the best cooperation. We did not have one argument. We discussed things, and if we felt he had the strongest argument, we would use his piece or okay. whatever. It went swimmingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what did you learn from one another? Not to write another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no we, we learned a lot because yes. the reason I asked Jeffrey originally to join me is because he has such an incredible knowledge uh, about camps and mail to camps mm -hmm. and you know all the different aspects related to to camps in Europe so I asked him originally I said could you help me with the camp but it expanded and I was so glad I asked him was the smartest thing I ever did was <laughs> was ask uh, ask Jeffrey to join me because mm -hmm. he's just a fantastic he's a walking encyclopedia about many things so yeah, you're very grateful. Now, now I'm going to blush. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> well, well, what did I learn from? Yes. Course? Yes, yes. Um, well, to set a time limit. <laughs> to set a time limit because if Case hadn't told me that, well, I'm approaching a certain age. Uh, we must, uh, we, we must <laughs> put it to an end. Otherwise, well, I, as Case said, when, when we stopped writing we found new information and it, it well new information uh, kept on coming so i suggested well shall we wait a moment the deadline we, we can move the deadline one month ahead so we can write another paragraph or another chapter but right. case said, oh, let's stop let's stop because otherwise well it will be a yeah, never ending right. story right. Yeah, and you know, one of the other things that happened, a lot of people, when they realized that we were working on this, came to us right. with archives and information. One of the things that specifically stands out to me, there was this son of a person, a fisherman. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about di dilemmas before, mm -hmm. moral dilemmas. The Dutch fishing fleet from Eymuiden was still out at sea, when the war broke out. And one of the fishing boats had a radio and heard that the Dutch had been attacked. So now, what would you do in this, in this situation? Are you going to go home? Or are you going to go to England? Where do you think, what do you think happened? They all went to England. Oh, really? All went to England, yeah. And most, most of them. Most, most, most of them, yeah, yeah. And the Dutch, uh, uh, some of those Dutch fishing boats were actually used at Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Yes. So t talking about about people coming to you with their archives, there, there was a man, uh, and he came with an archive. His uh, his family lived in Switzerland in 1940. And can you imagine staying living in Switzerland in 1940? One of the safest places in Europe at that time. They decided to leave the country because they feared a German invasion. And where did they go to? They went to the Dutch East Indies. They went from, from Switzerland to Africa because there was no direct connection to the Dutch East Indies. So it took them months in order to, to reach the Dutch East Indies. And when they arrived there, just before the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, they thought they were safe. 
But then, well, well, the rest is history. They were all uh, arrested, interned, and sadly, many of the members of the family perished in, in the Japanese camps. So yeah. Yeah. when do you take the right decision? Another interesting thing is that one of their travel companions, a non-family member, had a suitcase full of money and advanced all the money for everybody in the group. There were about 15, something like yeah, that. something like that. And they traveled all through Africa. And he, paid, he says, you'll pay me back in the Dutch East Indies. And they did. And they did. But he had, there are pictures of him. Actually, the story yes. is in the, it's in the book. It's a, it's a wonderful story how some people are so uh, selflessly offering their own financial resources or whatever to help other people. The book is replete with that. It's wonderful to yes, see yes. Mm -hmm. humanity. Good. That's okay. what it's all about. I'd like it open up to the floor for questions. Uh, can you pass the mic back, Dan, right here? Yes, Henry Hetker. I wondered uh, regarding uh, rare stamps. What is the rarest Dutch colonial stamp? You really didn't get into this. My uncle had a big collection of stamps, including Netherlands, and he had the 20 golden stamp uh, pre-1900 a rare stamp used. He didn't have it unused. But I wondered, uh, he was very proud of it. I wonder, is there anything in the Dutch colonial series that, that might be equivalent to this? And another question, the Japanese, I would think, probably overprinted stamps when they got into the Indies. Are any of these extremely rare? Are any of them questionable? Uh, is there anything to be known about that? Hmm. Well, the, uh, the, the subject, the first subject is not really uh, suitable for this because we're not really talking about stamps. And I know we, uh, Susan is looking at us because we have a time limit. So uh, I'll, I'll address the, uh, the second part, if I may. Uh, the Japanese apparently, uh, well, there are a lot of Japanese overprints of Dutch East Indies stamp, if, if that's what you, what you meant. And some of them are extremely rare. And there are thousands of them. They're, they're, you know, I don't collect that. but. Uh, it's outside my range. I don't really collect stamps. I really collect postal history. But uh, there are many of them, but there are many forgeries. So, so, so if you oh, yeah. get one, always make sure that just someone checks upon them because probably it's falsified. Yes. <laughs> uh, I believe 40,000 NSB fought on the Russian front. Well, is there any postal history relating to, I don't know if they were Stalingrad or where they were, uh, sent back to the Netherlands? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I obtained a small archive of, of, uh, of two young people corresponding with each other. The strange thing is it, it contains 40 or 50 letters right from the moment the, 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 the boy joined the, uh, the, the German army. And the only thing that they write about is, why haven't you written earlier to me? Because I've been waiting for, for, for some sign of life. And then suddenly there is, in this collection of 40 letters, there's one letter from, I think it's Stalingrad. And the, the only thing the boy says, I can't say much about what I'm experiencing now. I tell you after the war, full stop. Uh, yeah. But, but indeed, there is some correspondence left from, uh, from well, Russia. There was also a, a Dutch SS unit. Um, if they, they signed up, uh, um, if they, uh, one of the conditions, they said that the Germans said, well, if you sign up with the Dutch SS, um, you will not be sent to the Eastern Front. You'll go to a relatively safe area. So they signed up and promptly went to the Eastern Front, of course. That's what happened. Yes, unfortunately, most of these, these coffers don't contain any letters. Because after the war, they were uh, believed to be traitors and, and uh, quislings, indeed. So, so, well, probably people were ashamed of, of the contents of these letters. For a long time, World War II was not a very popular subject. No, no. You know, it was not collected that much. Certainly when I was growing up in Holland, you know, I, collect, I started to collect stamps in 1947 when I was seven years old. And uh, I did not, uh, you know, nobody collected World War II. That was a, people wanted to take mental distance from them. Yes. It was, they had experienced so much. You know, in my case, my father died when he was 33. 
I was eight, was a result of the war. So the war was always a, a very uh, touchy subject. And on top of all of everything, uh, you know, I found out through the Freedom of Information Act that an uncle, uh, a brother of my mother, uh, whom, according to family lore, was one of the parachutists who landed at Arnhem during Operation Market Garden, had in fact been a tailor in the German uh, Navy. <laughs> so, uh, my mother said, if my father, if, if my grandfather, her, her father, if he'd, he'd ever known about that, he would have killed him. <laughs> so, yeah. But there were all these conflicts, you know. I married a German woman, you know. So the German side was sitting on one side during the wedding, and the <laughs> Dutch side was, I thought World War III was going to break out because, you know, my grandfather was not the most subtle guy. I mean, he, he refused to speak German. And, of course, my father-in-law was in the German army. He was a uh, telegraph operator. And uh, he was telling everybody what a great time he'd had in Holland during the war. And then we found out in some pictures he had been stationed in my hometown. So, you know... Uh, why do you think we moved to the States? <laughs> um, my name is Megan Lewis. I'm a librarian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And so thank you for letting everyone know that we were so helpful to your research. Oh, yeah. um, and we actually, in the two decades I've worked there, we do periodically get letters from or emails from collectors saying, I got this letter from a POW camp or a concentration camp, do you have any further information on this person? And we will try to help, uh, especially with political prisoners. They, from like Dachau, they had to write their prisoner number, so it's actually fairly easy for some of the camps to find information on that person. So you answered my first question was, because I know there was a high, you know, the members of the Dutch SS unit and, you know, a uh, high percentage of the Dutch population were actually official members of the Dutch Nazi party, a higher percentage than actually Germans were official members of the German Nazi parties, and so I was going to ask, how does that relate to after the war? And it sounds like people just didn't talk to it, the materials were destroyed. The second question is, because I have, we do have your book, so if anyone wants to come to see it at our library, we're open Monday through Friday, 10 to 5. Um, you do have a lot about personal information, and we get a lot of genealogists who look at our collections of letters saying, uh, you know, this is the last you know, a piece of paper that ever showed that my grandmother actually existed on the planet, or in some cases, the only document that shows my mother or grandmother had ever lived. Have you gotten any, uh, reached out from any family members whose families were in this book that didn't know these materials had happened, or do you have? Well, in Holland, the situation is, is uh, very controversial because there were 150,000 Jews in Holland uh, before the war, and in Holland, believe it or not, the highest percentage of Jews uh, didn't make it to the end. Uh, I think 125,000 were killed. Uh, so there were only 25,000. There were a lot of reasons for that. Holland geographically is very flat and it doesn't have many forests. And it, you know, so people had to hide in uh, farms. And my grandfather went in hiding. He's not Jewish, but he went into hiding. He didn't see the sunlight for a year. You know, so there were a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of circumstances that con contributed to that. But uh, I have uh, been in touch with so many people uh, whom I was able to give information to. It was really surprising to me, actually, I was stunned, actually, to find out how a lot of people uh, have not bothered to trace their family roots. To me, you know, that is... I was in my hotel yesterday. I'll give you an example. I was talking to this young man who worked there. I was waiting, and, um, and he, was, he was Jewish. And um, he says, what do you, I said, well, uh, you know, talking at the uh, museum tomorrow. He says, you know, my family was Jewish, and they came. Uh, my grandfather came here just before the war and fought during the war. I said, do you have any details on it? I said, do you have any letters on it? No, no, we've never bothered to investigate. I mean, that to me is so <laughs> against everything that I believe in because I have to figure out everything. Yeah? 
it's the grandchildren now who are doing yeah. in our, and we have one collection where it's a philately collection, and it was re-cataloged, and the archivist wrote down every to and from of every letter, and within six months of that finding aid going on our website, because our collections catalog is Google searchable, so people aren't even going through the collections catalog, they're going through Google and finding it. We got six requests for copies of specific documents, and so we had to keep ordering the collection from off-site storage, and when we started digitizing collections, the reference staff was like, do this one first, because we're tired of yeah. having, to, A, it's not good for the paper, and B, we're just tired of having to have it shipped back and forth, so. Oh. Um, and, you know, we've had, talk about your person who wrote letters, this is not the first case of it, and we actually have three letters from three different stamp collectors from the same person. He was a Viennese Jew who was a professor at a business college, and he wrote every business college in the United States looking for someone to sponsor him. Unfortunately, he could not find anyone to sponsor yeah. him, sure. but he saw the exact same letter. Three different stamp collector, collectors found copies, and they all sent them to us. Yeah. So that parallels the person that I was talking about. about. And we, I know of another case where the f husband and wife sat down and wrote everyone in New York with the same common Jewish last name uh, sat in the New York phone book and found someone to sponsor them that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a teacher. And, and they, they sometimes, well, my students sometimes ask me, sir, sir, do you have any hobbies? And when I tell them that I collect stamps, you see them think, oh, this man doesn't know what to do with his time. And probably some silly old fool. But when I tell them what, what I did, that not only collect stamps, but what, what I do, and that I wrote the book, and I start, st start telling the stories, then they start to become all ears, and they want to know, and they start asking questions. So, well, I think, yes, social history is part of the future, because future generations will, will, will be interested in, in the stories behind the covers and behind all the documents that... Uh, well, in our case, we have assembled about the Second World War. According to my mother, I, I, I started collecting, or I was interested in letters at a very early age. I was always fascinated by the mailman who would put these pieces of paper into the individual slots. So I must have been four, maybe five. Uh, I found this packet of letters uh, in a cabinet at home. It had a little pink ribbon around it. And so I immediately removed the ribbon, and I knew what to do with those letters. I put them into all the neighbors' mailboxes. <laughs> and they were my parents' love letters, which they, my mother always was amazed that I did not wind up in the Amsterdam underworld after such uh, <laughs> early criminal behavior. <laughs> so, yeah. Are there any final questions? We have time for one more. Okay, well, big round of applause, please, for Case and Jeffrey.